Good morning. Uh, it's my privilege and honor to uh, introduce our featured speaker, uh, Chaplain and Colonel Michael Brainer started his Army career enlisting in the Rhode Island Army National Guard. He was later given an early commission in 1982 through the ROTC program at the University of Rhode Island. Following graduation, he was accepted into the Army graduate program, allowing him to attend the Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, where he received a Master's of Divinity in 1989 and was soon after ordained through the Southern Baptist Convention. Upon ordination, he returned to active duty as an Army chaplain, where he held several positions through the next 30 years of his Army career. While on active duty, Chaplain Brainerd served in various operational units to include the 7th Infantry Division Light, where he and then several tours as a paratrooper in the United States Army Special Forces. Therefore! Can I say something? <laughs> it may take a while to get through this. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Special Forces. And the 7th Special Forces Group Airborne. His overseas tours while serving in Special Forces include several hostile fire areas, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Turkey, Northern Iraq, and culminated with two combat tours in Afghanistan. Later he served in several chaplain positions throughout the world in Hawaii, Germany, and many garrisons within the United States. As a colonel, Mike served as the Command Chaplain, Joint Forces Headquarters, National Capital Region, where he was able to assist the President of the United States with giving prayers at several functions hosted by the President. <laughs> chaplain Brainerd's final tour before retirement was as the Command Chaplain, United States Army of North America, a unit established to defend the U.S from natural disasters to possible enemy incursions. Chaplain Brainerd's military education includes the Command and General Staff College, clinical pastoral education from Walter Reed Army Medical Center, and the Masters of Strategic Studies from the United States Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Mike's awards and decorations include the Army Force, the Armed Forces Expeditionary Medal, the Southwest Asia Service Medal, Operation Enduring Freedom Medal, Global War on Terrorism Expeditionary Medal, Global War on Terrorism Service Medal, Army Achievement Medal, Army Commendation Medal, Meritorious Service Medal, and the Legion of Merit. He wears a uniform that is specially reinforced to carry all that medal, by the way. One last thing, Mike uh, indicated to me that as a chaplain, when you jump out of an airplane, you don't necessarily pray. You say other things, and one blackbird would know what that is. Well, without further ado, can we give Colonel Brainerd a warm dog call up? veterans know what danger close means? Well, you're danger close right now. You've got a uh, Baptist minister who hasn't had a pulpit four years after having one for 35 years, and now you've got me standing here at a thing that looks like a pulpit. So I'm trying to remind myself this is not a religious event. I'm not here to preach. I'm just here to talk about a couple of things. Uh, and I better get it done quickly because I'm telling you, four years of retirement, this uniform's getting closer and tighter every minute. 
But that's okay. That's okay. But I'm not here. This is not a religious event. I got it. I got it. But I was asked to talk about a little bit of the history of the Chaplain Corps, and I'm going to do so. And then after that, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Veterans Day means. I'm going to do a little history about why we have Veterans Day on the 11th. Many of y'all might have heard this story before, but I think a lot of you probably haven't. But what I'm going to do is, and you're going to say, oh, he's being the bad preacher. I'm going to open with a text from the scripture. And I'm honestly, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to preach from that text, but I want you to understand something. If we're going to talk about the history of the Chapel Corps, George Washington started the Chapel Corps. 29 July, 1775. It was just six short weeks after he started the Continental Army. So the Continental Army with its infantry, the infantry is probably the first branch. The second branch in the military was the Chapel Corps. And if you're going to understand why George Washington and the Continental Congress wanted a Chapel Corps, I'm going to read you these verses just so it might make a little sense to you. Just so you understand the cultural context of what they were going through back in the 1700s and prior. What they were like, what meant a lot to them. So I'm going to read this text. Psalm 33 tells us, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven, and he sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his strength. You see, you need to understand that when George Washington started uh, the Chapel Corps, he knew that his men needed some representative from God to be in the force. So the chaplains had an expeditionary role. We were brought into the military so that we could go to places with our soldiers, be with our soldiers. He knew that they needed some moral support when they were on the battlefield. So what we do as chaplains is we bring, we, we call it, we say God to soldiers and soldiers to God. So George Washington, because of their culture in those days, knew that the army would not be successful unless we stayed in the presence of God and did his bidding with strength. And he knew his soldiers needed to have their ministrations, religious ministrations when they wanted them. So he went to the Continental Congress and he made the chaplain corps come into existence. So again, we're the second branch in the military, believe it or not behind the infantry. So George Washington started it. He knew it was the right thing to do. So he brought in a man of the cloth. Because back then, they called themselves God-fearing people. We don't say that too much today, right? But back then, that's how they thought. They were God-fearing people in America. And he knew when his men marched to battle, he wanted a clergy person to be with them, to go through everything with them, to suffer with them, and even to die with them. That's boosting morale. And George Washington knew that. So July 29, 1775, the Chapel Corps was born. The Continental Congress voted to place in every regiment, which is basically a brigade, one chaplain. Since then, the chaplains have served in every war. First, it was Protestant chaplains. Later, it became Catholic priests. We're added to the ranks during the Civil War. We brought on black chaplains. We brought on rabbis. They were brought into the corps. Years later, we brought women to the court. In fact, the Navy has had a chief of chaplains that was a woman, a wonderful woman. Her name was Admiral uh, Margaret Kibbett. When I was a command chaplain of the National Capital Region, I actually brought her in. As, she, was the, as she was actually a brigadier general. She was the chief of chaplains for the Marine Corps. And then when she pinned on her second star, she became the chief of chaplains from the, for the Navy. So we've had women in all ranks throughout the chaplain corps. And like I said earlier, our job was to bring God to soldiers and soldiers to God. Again, from its start, General Washington knew that there was inherently within us a strong spiritual, moral component. And if his soldiers were going to be successful in battle, then God needed to be worshipped, God needed to be served, and the spiritual side of our being needed to be nurtured. Again, I don't want to preach. I'm just telling you the history. And that's why George Washington brought them into the, into the fold. Just as an interesting note, this is free, you're not paying me for this comment. In the Old Testament, when King David, remember King David? The guy in Goliath, you know those stories from long ago? His training calendar, King David became a great general. His training calendar had 50% tactical training and 50% was worshiping God. That's what he did before he went to battle. Just thought I'd throw that out there. 
I'm not sure any of my commanders really want to have 50% worship before a battle engagement, but yeah, I'm just letting you know that's the way it was. There are many stories of chaplains who served bravely, bravely while under fire. One story that we honor greatly in the chapel courts, the four chaplains on the USS Dorchester. Uh, years ago, at the beginning of World War II, uh, the USS Dorchester set out of Dorchester, Massachusetts, near Boston. And on the way to Europe, it was actually torpedoed, and the ship went down. Well, there were four chaplains aboard that ship. Lieutenant George Fox, he was a Methodist minister. Lieutenant Alexander Good, who was a Jewish rabbi. Lieutenant John Washington, who was a Roman Catholic priest. And Lieutenant Carl Clark Poling, he was a Dutch Reform ministers, all the all the different uh, services or all the different religions were represented. Well, when the ship was torpedoed, what happened was the waters were very frigid and there weren't enough water uh, life preservers to go around. So what those four chaplains did was they took off their life preservers and they gave them to the other sailors and soldiers that were on the board. Well, the survivors of that sinking said the last thing they saw was the four chaplains holding hands, singing songs and praying while they went under the water and died. That's what chaplains have done for this nation. There's another chaplain, Chaplain Francis Leon Sampson of World War II and Korea fame. He later became the chief of chaplains and was a major general. And here's something I'm sure y'all don't know. You've all heard the, the movie uh, Saving Private Ryan, right? Well, it was Chaplain Sampson in his real life story of rescuing a young soldier because that became the inspiration for that film, Saving Private Ryan was a chaplain. They tried to bring Private Ryan out of the ranks and save him. That was this man. And this guy went on. Believe it or not, he went on. He had three combat jumps. If you're a paratrooper, who I know some of y'all here, you do a combat jump, you get what we call a mustard stain on your wings. You get a little gold star. Chaplain Sampson had three combat jumps in World War II. He was captured twice in World War II. The first time he was captured, he came down, he landed in a river in, uh, at St. Home du Mont. I hope I said that halfway decently if you're French, excuse me. But he landed in a river. And when he came out of the river, he ended up getting captured. They stuck him all in a barn. Uh, all, the, all, all the guys, and what they did to Chaplain Samson was they put him up against the wall, and the Germans were going to execute him. They were going to kill him. And the word is that he was so nervous and so scared that instead, he was a Roman Catholic priest, I should say, instead of saying whatever uh, uh, prayers you say, when you're going through a situation like that, the only thing coming out of his mouth is he kept repeating a prayer that you say at the, at the breakfast meal. And he just kept repeating it over and over again. He was so scared. But he stood there. Well, you know what saved his life? A German soldier who was Roman Catholic jumped up and said, this guy's a priest. He is nothing. He, he will do nothing. So they took this guy, they interrogated him for a while, and they realized that he was a chaplain, just serving his soldiers. He wasn't really a leader. He wasn't a combat leader. So they let him go. Well, if that wasn't enough, he had to jump in somewhere else and he managed to get himself recaptured. <laughs> Except this time, he stayed in, in a camp for a little while. That's who General, Major General Sampson was. I could go on and on and on about chaplains and the things they've shown. In the last few years, when I was a command chaplain in the National Capital Region around 2013-2014, there was a chaplain they brought out of the, uh, the, the rice paddies of Vietnam, Chaplain Emil Capon. And we posthumously gave him the Medal of Honor for bravery. What he did was he was captured too. And he was in a concentration camp. Incidentally, when things happen in war, and you have wounded left behind, the chaplain's job is to stay with the wounded. And they get captured. And it's not a good thing. Well, Emil Capon got captured. He goes to a concentration camp or prisoner war camp, and he starves to death. They didn't feed him well, and he started to death, and he died right before the war ended. So we honored him. You know, in Korea, there was a couple of chaplains that were captured in Korea. And the enemy, being very smart, they knew to bring the morale down of the soldiers, airmen, and rings, say, whoever was in those uh, POW camps, they knew that if they tortured the chaplain and, and hurt him and made his life miserable and made him scream out and all these kinds of things, they knew that would bring the morale down. That's what he did. So no chaplain survived incarceration in Korea. Before I went to the desert, uh, even Saudi Arabia, but especially Afghanistan and Iraq, they give us briefs as chaplains. You know, we don't carry weapons. I did when I was an MP. I carried a 45. I thought I was pretty cool. But that was a long time ago. 
Now I'm going to chat. So he used to brief us. So he said, look, man, if you get captured, they're going to use you as an example. So you guys need to watch yourselves. You need to make sure you don't do stupid stuff out on convoys. Let yourself get lost. And that's what they do. And again, I'm not, these are extremist Muslims, so it's not that, that religion. It was these extremists that we fought ISIS, the Taliban. So it was a tricky thing. So we know that you want to be protected. See, they looked at religious leaders as the leaders. See, we in America, we don't do that. Our religious leaders aren't necessarily leaders, right? They're, they're chaplains. They're, they're whoever. But in some countries, the religious leaders are the leaders, just like in the Old Testament. So they thought we would be somebody and they wanted to make sure that chaplains would not be uh, treated well. So we've always kind of had to watch our back and because of that, they give us chaplain assistance and they are our arms bearers. My mother, every time I had a tour over the years, my mother always wanted to meet my armor bearer to know who I was going to go to combat with just so she know his name so she could pray for him too. <laughs> Praise God, he never really had to jump up and do anything for him, but we certainly ran a few times, that's for sure. Chaplains and chaplain's assistants were both killed in combat. In Iraq, there was a Staff Sergeant Christopher Stout and Chaplain Dale Getz. They both uh, got blown up in IED attacks. So chaplains, even up to the most recent war we've had, they've been giving their lives for their soldiers. Wherever our soldiers go, we go. A number of y'all made comments about my jump wings. I got German jump wings on it. The reason why I have that is because the chaplain has to go where his soldiers go. So if you're in the 82nd Airborne, the one first Airborne back in the day when they jumped, or in your special forces, if my chap, if my soldiers are going somewhere, I gotta go with them. So we have to do all this training too. We go to the ranger schools, the jump schools, all these kinds of things. That's what chaplains do. That's the way we see our call. I have to say though, and I'll close in my chaplain's uh, section of this, there were some challenges to the chaplain corps, and it happens. And I can kind of understand it. Think about it now. Chaplains are paid by your tax dollars, just like any other service member. Well, over the years, we've become more secular as a nation. So every once in a while, somebody will rise up and they'll try to challenge the chaplain corps. Well, in 1979, there were two Harvard Law students, seniors, and they wanted to cha uh, challenge the chaplain corps. And this is the one that probably got the furthest. What they did was, and by the way, a man named Israel Drazen, who's a retired chaplain himself, wrote a book about this. It's called For God and Country. That's our motto, Pro Deo et Patria, for God and country. So this is a book about the history of the constitutional challenge to the Army chaplaincy. So basically, I'm going to paraphrase this, but it's pretty significant. It's kind of interesting. What happened was these two Harvard Law students got into the courts, whatever, and it was being adjudicated. They go through the arguments of why we shouldn't have a chaplain corps. Why should people have to pay their tax dollars? If people are atheist, agnostic, a-religious, why are their tax dollars paying for some guy to wear a cross or tablets or whatever they might wear and get paid taxpayer dollars, right? Separation of church and state, right? So you kind of... So what happened was the arguments went on, it went on, they did all their thing. Well, then at the very end of it, when the judge was ready to adjudicate this situation, he called all the lawyers up front. And this old judge looked at uh, those guys and he said, you know, when I was 18 years old, I was in Korea. I was on the side of a frozen field. I was scared to death, didn't know if I'd make it from one day to the next. My buddy and I just sat there freezing. We didn't think we were gonna make it. If it wasn't cold, we thought the enemy would get us. And we were scared. All night long, we were scared. And you know what? The only person that visited me in that foxhole was my chaplain. My chaplain. No civilian lawyer came to visit me. No civilian minister came to visit me. It was a chaplain. He sat in the hole with me. He talked with me. He calmed us down. He gave us words of encouragement. He prayed with us. He read some scripture to us. And he let us know that we could make it. And if we weren't going to make it, he was going to die with us. And we knew it. Go take your seats and I'm going to adjudicate this. <laughs> <laughs> Chaplains are always there. We're there to serve our soldiers because we love them. Our airmen, our marines, our sailors, our coast guardsmen. We're very joint too. We go over to places now. I've served with many Navy SEALs as a special forces chaplain. Done a lot of great stuff. It's been a lot of fun. That's all I'm going to say about the chaplain history because I do want to march over. It wasn't me when a Baptist preacher went to his wife. It means absolutely nothing. <laughs> but now I'm going to tell you a little bit of history that I wrote down about Veterans Day that I don't think many of y'all might be aware of. 
We all know that Veterans Day is a special holiday that honors all those who have served and served the United States military, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guardsmen. And we all have the professional ethos of we will never accept defeat. But please allow me to give you a brief history lesson here. In World War I, it was fought with many countries over a five-year period, beginning over 100 years ago in 1914 and ending in 1918. The United States fought in this war from 1917 to 1918. In 1918, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, that is 11 o'clock on November 11th, the war and countries signed an agreement called an armistice that brought an end to the war. So I've heard a lot of people complain over the years, why don't we celebrate it on a Friday or Monday so we can have a long weekend? Well, there's, there's concrete history that demonstrates we've got to do it on the 11th of November. That's just the way it's going to be. So the long weekend might have to go so we can celebrate it on a Wednesday or Thursday like we're doing right now. The 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month, we celebrate this. On that day, people throughout the world were happy. They celebrated because no one else would get hurt or die in the war. And loved ones would be coming home. People went out in the streets. They were dancing. They were laughing. They blew horns. They blew whistles. They sang songs. The people at that time very wistfully thought there would be no more world wars. In fact, World War I was nicknamed the War to End All Wars. You've heard that, right? The War to End All Wars. We stand here in 2021. Unfortunately, that was not the case, right? United States President Woodrow Wilson named November 11th a holiday called Armistice Day at first in honor of the heroes that died in World War I. Incidentally, more people died in the trenches of World War I due to disease than they did from enemy fire. That's how miserable our soldiers and veterans had it back in World War I. Over time, the name of the holiday has changed to Veterans Day, and the purpose of this day was changed to honor all who have served and are serving in the United States Armed Forces. And I'll tell you something right now, a service member will tell you they're not especially brave, they're not necessarily special. They're, we're just doing our job. And many of y'all have been there, you know that. Not all veterans have been to war, but many like myself have served in a war. And I don't want to focus on me, but just to let you know what veterans go through, I spent many months, years, actually deployed to places like Saudi, Bosnia, Iraq, Afghanistan. But you know, the worst part of it was not the war itself. The worst part was being away from my family. I missed five Christmases. I missed more than 15 birthdays from my three children. Not to mention the four or five I missed of my wife's birthdays. And again, I'm not saying this to focus on me because many of y'all have been there too. That's what it means to be a veteran. It means sacrifice. In my case, my wife was very independent and she handled it well. But I'm going to tell you right now, when I was out there in those cold deserts and I'm trying to put on Christmas celebrations for my guys, and I did it five times, I guess, over the years, you're, you're focused on home. Because that's what it's about, right? Amen, brother? Yes, sir. It's about home. It's not about pomp, it's not about circumstance, it's not about the great parade they're going to put you through when you get home. It's about the man or woman to the left and right of you. It's about your family back home that we do what we do. Amen, veterans? Amen. I'm sure that every veteran here today can relate to what I'm talking about because I know many of y'all have gone through the same experiences. But as I close, I just want to say right now as we gather here today, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this point up. As we gather here today, there are thousands of soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, National Guardsmen. They're on the job around the world right now protecting America. Do you know that? There are places that many of us can't even find on the map, and they're serving this very minute. They stand at the tip of the spear for our nation and her allies. As an Army man, my thoughts always turn to those men and women in the armed forces who are deployed around the world, around the clock, protecting and defending America on the oceans, on land, on the, anywhere they go. Our service members, they're on ships. They're on submarines like a couple of brothers I've talked to a little earlier. 
They served in the Cold War, fought the Cold War, and were successful, like my father did. My father was a submariner. Sir, thank you for your service. Nine year old, nine, nine year old submariner sitting right over there. Amen. World War II. They're on aircraft right now, flying in ungodly places, trying to make sure things stay peaceful. They're still in Afghanistan in some a little bit. They're still in Iraq. They're still doing these things. They're in places that we can't even mention because we just can't do it. They will be there when we are sleeping tonight. They will be there every Saturday, every Sunday, every holiday of this year and the coming years. Our service members, our future veterans will be there. We need to remember them. And they'll be missing their families, their friends, and their loved ones back home. For those veterans here today, please share your story with others. Let people know what you've done so they can see the many faces of military service and appreciate the personal service uh, and, and share this with your neighbors. If you're not a veteran, find someone in your life that was a vet and ask them about their service or at least go up to them and say thank you. The more we talk about what we do and the impact military service has on our lives, the better able we are to hold it up as an example of excellence. And I'm here to tell you, I was about to say, I'm here to tell you, church, this isn't a church. I'm here to tell you, folks, Dot Hall residents, family, friends, veterans, we need excellence in this world today. We need excellence in this country today. That's all I'll say about that. To all the veterans here today, I sincerely thank you for your service, your sacrifice. I share the pride you feel in being able to say you have served in the greatest military this world has ever seen. That's a fact. Thank you for choosing to honor veterans today and to show your support to all our heroes, both past and present. May God bless our veterans. May God bless those serving in harm's way at the tip of the spear right now. And may God continue to bless the United States of America.